Okie dokie. Let's do this. Good day, everyone. Welcome to another Meyer Sound webinar. How is the transmission? Can everybody hear me? Excellent. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Um, so today is all about M noise. Um, but before we're going to start looking at M noise, uh, let's do the household notes first. And that means that um, let's go to the relevant presentation. Um, and let's do this. And here we go. Let's share the screen. And um, this is always M noise is a little bit involved because uh, I make use of audio demonstrations, which I think are really uh, worthwhile. But that means that I um, need to make sure that everything is up and running as as it should. Bear with me. Okay, so let me double check. Okay, 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 okay. So that means that we are in a good place. So sorry for taking a little bit, little bit longer, but um, like I said, I wanna make sure that everything is working the way I intended to. So today's all about M noise, a new test signal, which is a better approximation of music, the program material that most people ultimately end up listening to. But before we start looking at that, uh, let's talk a little bit about Zoom, which is our video communication platform, um, which we use for these webinars. Um, in front of you, you are expected to have a window, not, unwind, not unlike the one you see over here. If you want to see who else is joining you on the call, uh, please click on the participant buttons, in which case a window opens up to the right side showing your fellow attendees in today's webinars. Um, we encourage you to ask questions as always, but in order to do so, we would like you to make use of the raise hand feature. Notice that in the bottom right corner, there's a gray button called raise hand. If you click that button, a blue hand icon pops up in the corner of my eye, informing me that you're about to ask a question. Now, in order to ask the question itself, we encourage you to make use of the chat feature, which you can activate by clicking on the balloon icon. If you click on the balloon icon, then the right hand window splits in half, bringing up a new dialogue, the chat dialogue with a field at the bottom where you can enter a message and address the nation. That is to say everyone that is joining us today on the call. Or if you happen to see a, a fellow family member or a fellow colleague or a friend among the list of participants, you can also address that person in private. And that pretty much uh, concludes the Zoom household notes. Uh, for those that are joining us through the Myersound user community uh, Facebook group, welcome to you as well. Uh, we're simulcasting as we speak. We're streaming live to Facebook. And uh, the group is currently counting over 8,750. That is 8,750 members and, and growing. So welcome to you as well. Thank you for being there. Um, and that means that, as always, we're going to talk about another pillar and this is, this, is, this is basically one of the most recent additions to our tool set, which is M-Noise. M-Noise is uh, something that is very dear to us as we're about to discover. So um, let's take it away. Um, what is M-Noise? M-Noise is a new test signal that is a better approximation for music, the program material that you and I ultimately end up listening to. Uh, M-Noise is gaining so many attention or attracting so many attention that as we speak for almost one year now, the AS has a task group that is investigating whether M noise and its companion procedure that we'll talk about today, the procedure for determining the maximum linear peak SPL, the maximum performance capabilities of a loudspeaker, that is currently being discussed within the AS and is being uh, assessed whether it merits uh, adoption, adoption as an AS standard. So the, the Meyer Sound proposal is in the process of hopefully becoming an AES standard, um, which would be truly awesome for reasons that um, I'm about to uh, disclose. Because let's start with a simple thought experiment. Imagine or think back of a time where we got to enjoy live concerts, which hopefully is gonna happen again in the future. But remember, okay, live concert, 
and uh, we're enjoying the music. Now, what if I were to attach an oscilloscope using my alligator clips to the um, output of the mixing console during the event? Well, then chances are that you're going to see some sort of waveform, not necessarily a sine wave, but you're going to see some waveform during the concert, waveform of the mix that is made on the console. You're going to see a waveform on the oscilloscope. Same is true if I were to connect that oscilloscope to a DJ console during an electronic dance music uh, event. Um, chances are that it might already start to resemble a sine wave, but that's a different conversation altogether. That being said, you're going to see some sort of waveform. Even if I am watching, surprise, Star Wars in my case, watching Star Wars in the confinement of my living room, and I were to connect the oscilloscope to my Blu-ray player, I will end up seeing the waveform that represents John Williams' score, that um, uh, represents John Williams' music. Now, why do I start with this metaphor? Because that waveform, regardless what it looks like, that depends on the program content, but that waveform is the electronic representation of art. It's the very thing that you're typically trying to preserve. But if you do large-scale sound reinforcement, or small-scale for that matter, you want to uh, amplify this art. You want to make it all the way up to the second or third balcony. Um, and many audio professionals will all agree that regardless of what the wave form looks like that a professional sound system should deliver said waveform while turning it from volts into pascal but should deliver that waveform without altering the waveform in any way without turning sine waves into square waves or adding distortion uh, without changing the waveform in any way unless it is part of the artistic decision making process which is an entirely different conversation but if the loudspeaker system is linear, then every audio professional will agree that a loudspeaker system is expected to faithfully deliver that waveform, the art, without messing with the waveform, unless it's done intentionally. So that waveform, keep it in the back of your mind, that is the very thing that, is we're, trying, that we're trying to typically preserve. We only want to make it louder using uh, a sound system of sorts. Okay, because here's the thing. If I were to ask you, how do you determine the weight of a loudspeaker? And please use the chat. Use the chat to answer this question. How would you find out the weight of a loudspeaker? Have you ever put a loudspeaker on a scale? And please use the chat to answer that question. Have you ever put a loudspeaker on a scale to figure out its weight? Or do you go about it in a different way? Do you resort to a different solution to figure out the weight of a loudspeaker? Anyone? Please use the chat. Okay, it looks like um, nobody is willing to answer. So I'm gonna give you the typical answer. If people want to figure out the weight of a loudspeaker, they surely do not put it on a skill. They consult a data sheet or a manual. So they go to the last page in the, in the manual or they go to the data sheet and they look up the column which says weight and then uh, they will find the weight of the loudspeaker. And nobody questions that value because everybody assumes that a respectable manufacturer should be capable of accurately and precisely determining the weight of a loudspeaker. So nobody second guesses the weight of a loudspeaker that you'll find in a data sheet or in a manual, because we have a very clear definition of a kilogram and it's been around for uh, several centuries. So nobody questions that. But what is the deal with maximum loudness? How do I go about finding the maximum performance capability of a loudspeaker? Uh, do you ever measure it yourself? Do you ever test it? Or like finding the weight of a loudspeaker, do you consult the manual or a data sheet? And uh, I think I would not be surprised that the vast majority of users uh, will consult a data sheet, will consult a manual or a website or a product page to find out the maximum performance capabilities of a loudspeaker. And now it becomes very interesting because that number, which is maybe a double digit or a triple digit figure, that number is typically treated with the, the same lack of scrutiny as the weight of a loudspeaker. Just like people assume that a manufacturer should be able of accurately determining the weight of a loudspeaker, they also assume that the same is true for figuring out the maximum performance capabilities of a loudspeaker. So if a data sheet 
says uh, that a given loudspeaker has a peak SPL value of 100 dB at one meter distance, then very few people will question that and believe that value at, um, at, at, at first sight on first sight. But do you know what made the loudspeaker manufacturer stop at that level? What made them stop at that particular level and not increase the drive to the system, stop at that level, and then document it into the uh, manual or into the user guide? What was their decision-making process? Which, what, what were the reasons for them to say, and this is where the buck stops? The so-called stop conditions. Which conditions needed to be met in order for that manufacturer to say, this is the maximum acceptable level for this particular product? And the answer is you don't know because nobody publishes the stop condition. No manufacturer that I'm aware of discloses until recently, discloses uh, the stop conditions. What led them to say until here and no further, and now we're gonna document the value, whatever value it is, we're gonna document the value in the interest of a data sheet or a manual. Um, you're typically will not succeed, you typically not succeed at figuring out those stop conditions. And at the same time, there is no organization that I'm aware of that overlooks the, the, the process of determining the maximum performance capability of a loudspeaker. Which means that if you inflate your numbers or deflate your numbers, that there's no organization that will slap you on the wrist for making up numbers which are too large or making up numbers which are too small. And that means that in today's industry, as we speak, in the absence of standardization, that standardization, you're pretty much free to publish any figure that um, meets your meets your uh, meets your plan, meets your organization, it meets your goals, um, and nobody will slap you on the wrist. And uh, that means that, as it is, I cannot compare two data sheets. I cannot compare a data sheet of manufacturer Y against manufacturer Z because manufacturer Y and Z might use different stop conditions, which lead them to publish a value uh, for a particular product. So I cannot compare apples to apples and the playing field is not leveled. And I wanna emphasize that a little bit. Imagine that I were to hire a car and a cargo plane, and I take the car on board of the cargo plane and we go to, uh, to 30,000 feet uh, cruising altitude. And now I open the door of the cargo plane and I throw the car out of the cargo plane. Now on the ground, I have a friend and that person has a laser pistol and uh, he sees the car falling out of the sky and he's aiming his laser pistol at the falling car and sooner or later that car will reach terminal velocity. And I have the measurement, I have a factual measurement to confirm that this car happens to go terminal velocity. Now, if I put that in a data sheet, I am not lying. But maybe you should also mention that by the time the car hits the ground, it can no longer be used because it's a complete wreck. Um, so this is a metaphor. This is, of course, a little bit tongue in the cheek. But um, without disclosing the conditions, publishing a, a performance metric, whether it's speed in case of the car or maximum SPL in case of a loudspeaker, publishing a value without the conditions, without the rules of engagement, is, is a pretty futile uh, exercise and and this is this is an important thing um, for those of you that are involved in tenders where you get to bid uh, for 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 doing a job for commissioning and and providing a sound system if you're involved in the process of tenders then very often the tender states that a particular product of certain dimensions with a typical driver complement that that product needs to attain a certain level. And um, if you cannot prove that you can reach that level, then very often you do not get a seat at the table. You're already out of the game before the game has even begun, which shows you the phenomenal power of that double digit or triple digit figure um, in, in situations where tenders are involved and such. Uh, but again, those numbers are typically copied from data sheets, again, without disclosing the rules of engagement, uh, without disclosing the stop conditions. So now values are being compared against each other. Values are being compared against each other without underlying knowledge of the rules of engagement, which does not level the playing field, does not allow you to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Now, 
in order to determine such a signal, uh, in order to determine such a maximum performance level, the maximum peak SPL of a loudspeaker, historically, we have been using pink noise. However, if you look at these band spectra showing the spectral content of pink noise, then pink noise is shown on the left. And you can identify it because it has a flat spectrum on a logarithmic scale because it has equal power per octave. Whereas if you compare the left picture to the right picture, which shows you an RTA or band spectrum of actual music, then you can already tell that these two pictures do not look the same, which raises the question, is pink noise the best test signal to determine the maximum SPL for a loudspeaker? Because it looks like these pictures are not entirely the same. Well, maybe then we should use music for determining the maximum loudness of a loudspeaker rather than pink noise. Sure, if you can agree on which song to use, okay? That being said, there has been a while, there has been a time where Meyer Sound would specify maximum output capability using music at the source for one simple reason, which is how often do you go to pink noise concert or how often do you enjoy a, a movie with a pink noise soundtrack? And the answer is probably never. Most of the time, if not all of the time, we enjoy concerts where music is being played and we go to movie with soundtracks containing speech and music as well, as well as sound effects. So we reasoned back then that you should use a signal that comes close to the ultimate program material that you end up listening to. But what is the problem with music? Music is sparse. That is to say, not all notes are played at the same time. Um, whereas if you had a test signal that has similar characteristics as music, and it would be based on noise, but not entirely, but based on noise, such as pink noise, for example, then it's dense, where all nodes are played at the same time. So Meyerson came up with a new test signal, which is called M noise, where the M stands for music. It's not Meyer noise, it's not marketing noise, it's the M for music, as in music noise. It is a scientifically derived test signal, which we feel is a better approximation of music, the actual program material that you and I typically end up listening to. And not only does it have the spectrum which one would expect of music, because there are several test signals as we're about to discover which have the spectral content of music, but much more important, it also has the dynamic characteristics of music. Specifically, it's crest factor, which for music, as we're about to discover, is something that changes with frequency, unlike pink noise. So not only does it has the spectral content of music, but it also has the dynamic properties of music, unlike pink noise. And finally, it is a test signal like all noise signals that is practical to use with transfer function analyzers such as SMART and SIM. So let's see, uh, what is crest factor? Very important. So here we have a snare drum. Now, we're gonna bring up a sound meter and every time that I hit the snare drum, on the right side of the screen, we see the instantaneous peak value, whereas on the left side of the screen, we see the average value averaged over one second. Now, can anyone confirm that you hear the audio of the keynote? Because that is a big thing. Maybe Oscar can confirm. Is the audio audible? Excellent. Thank you for confirming. So, in the bottom of the screen, we saw our waveform. And every time we hit the snare drum, we have a peak value, the instantaneous peak, which is the peak in our waveform, the highest value in a waveform that defines the peak value. And at the same time, we see a one second average. One second would be the um, slow setting on your sound level meter. That's a one second integration time. So on the left side of the screen, you see the average value over one second interval. The difference between the peak value and the average value indicated by the blue bar in your screen, that is what we call crest factor. It is the peak to average ratio as we're about to discover. Now, as long as I keep hitting the snare drum with the same intensity, that peak value will not rise and it will not fall. So let's hit the snare drum four more times and pay attention to the peak value. One two, three, four. As long as I hit it with the same intensity, we have a peak value of about 142, 143 decibels and the average value 
remained about the same. So at this point, that crest factor looks to be somewhat stable, looks to be somewhat stationary. But watch what happens if we hit the drum even more often, that is to say, more rapidly. Now, for those that were paying careful attention, you might have noticed that regardless of how often I hit that snare drum, that that peak value remained the same. But as I started to hitting that snare drum more often, more repetitions, the green meter started to eat up, started to fill the bar. And the difference between those two indicated by that blue bar, that difference shrunk, which means that my crest factor became less as I started to hit the snare drum more often, which is why we like to say crest factor, the difference between peak and average, is determined by how hard I hit the snare drum, because that determines the peak in the waveform, and how often I hit the snare drum. Because if I hit the snare drum more often in a given time interval, my average level gains market share, whereas if I hit it fewer times within a given time interval, time interval, then the RMS level, or the average level, I should say, drops. So crest factor, you can think of as, is the difference between how hard I hit the snare drum and how often I hit the snare drum. And that is something that I would like to look into a little bit more in depth. Okie dokie. So let's go to the next slide. Here we see a sine wave. Here we see a single revolution of, uh, of a sine wave. Uh, left to right shows you time, and the interval goes from T1 to T2. That is your time interval. And top to bottom, we see amplitude with positive values and negative values. And that also means that on an oscilloscope, which we're looking at on an oscilloscope, you will see positive values with positive polarity, and you will see negative values that have um, negative uh, polarity. And we see a single revolution, a single uh, repetition uh, of a sine wave on the oscilloscope. And uh, this is where I normally ask, what is the average value? What is, this, what is the average value of this sine wave over the time interval T1, T2? Well, if you work that out mathematically, you will find that the average value of this sine wave, you take all your audio samples and then you average them, then you will get zero. The mathematical average of this sine wave signal is zero. Now, out of the electrical outlet over here next to me, there's also a sine wave coming out of the electrical outlet. It's AC, it's alternating current. So the average value of the alternating current coming out of the electrical outlet is zero. Now, anyone who believes that is kindly invited to wet their fingers and stick it into the nearest electrical outlet, because then you will feel what zero volts feels like. Anyone courageous enough to do so? Probably not, because we all know that if you stick your fingers in an electrical outlet, something bad is about to happen. So what is going on? Even though the average of this sine wave is zero, there is no zero volts coming out of the electrical outlet. I'm feeling a different kind of, a different amount of volts. So we need to figure out what is going on over there. Let's look at another waveform. Um, over here, we have another waveform. And I've constructed this waveform in such a way that its average is also zero. So if you were to add all these samples, the average value you would get out of it would still be zero. But we know that this is not true for sine waves. So um, we know that it's, zero for sine waves, but we know that we don't sense zero volts coming out of the electrical outlet, and neither is the case for the waveform that we see over here. So we need to figure out uh, a metric, a vessel, that allows us to come up with a number which uh, corresponds, to, um, corresponds to what we feel coming, like <laughs> when I stick my fingers in an electrical outlet. What we're basically asking is, which battery do I need? Which battery do I need uh, and what should it be rated? In other words, what is the value that should be printed on this battery, which is a DC, a direct current source, rather than an alternating current? Which value should we print on this battery to dissipate the same amount of electrical power in the purely resistive load, which I then can use to heat up my cup of tea? So... What we're looking for is the DC equivalent value, which is the thing that I sense when I stick my fingers in an electrical outlet. 
And that's what we're looking for. Which battery do I need to replace this waveform and still dissipate the same amount of electrical power into a purely resistive load? That's, that's what we're looking for. And in order to find that out, we're going to use RMS, which stands for root mean square. It's going to be a three-step process. So in the top left corner, in the top left corner, we see our original waveform. We see our original waveform in the interval T1, T2. So that's step one. Now, like I said, RMS stands for root mean square. And that means that the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to square our values. And if we square our values, then we get something which is proportional to power. Notice that power is proportional to squared values, whether it's squared current values or squared electromotor force, motor, motor force, uh, or known as volts, whether it's uh, proportional to uh, volts squared, but power is proportional to squared values. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take all our samples and we're going to square them, leaving us with only positive values. And notice that the area underneath the curve has been shaded blue because the power dissipation is proportional to the area underneath the curve. That is where the uh, key to our mystery lies. It is the area underneath the curve. So now we have our squared values. And the next thing that we're going to do in root mean square is we're going to take the mean of these squared values. So we're going to add all these squared values together. And then we're going to take the average. We're going to take the mean. And it's very important to point out that the red area, shaded red over here, is on average the same area as the blue shaded area upstairs. Okay, upstairs in picture two, we have the area underneath the curve. And downstairs, we see the same average area um, with respect to the picture in um, plot number two. So there we had our squaring and we had the mean. And that leaves us with the root because at this time, we're still looking at squared values. But we want to go back to the original value, which was non-squared values. And that's where your square root comes into the equation. So by applying a square root to our average, we end up getting the so-called DC equivalent value. The red line in the bottom left corner is the value that I should print onto my battery. And that will dissipate, that will dissipate the same amount of electrical power as my alternating waveform upstairs. These two waveforms, one is alternating current upstairs, the other one is direct current downstairs, they will dissipate the same amount of power in a purely resistive load. And in order to figure that number out, we had to apply uh, three steps. We squared our values, then we averaged them, and then we took the square root. Hence, root mean square, RMS. And the thing to take away from this is that the power is proportional to the area under the curve. If the area under the curve gains market share, then the mean area gains market share. And if the mean area gains market share, then the DC equivalent value goes up as well. And with that being said, let's go to the next slide. Because now we have several metrics to play with. That red line represents our root mean square value, which is colloquially referred to as the DC equivalent, or simply, that is the average value. This is what I feel when I stick my fingers in an electrical outlet. So that is our average value, but the waveform happens to have a peak. And in this instance, that peak happens to be positive. But on any given day, uh, it might very well be possible that the largest peak happens to be negative. So whichever peak is the largest one, whether it's positive or negative, determines the peak value of my waveform. Now, the ratio of that peak to the average value, the ratio of that peak to the average value, that is what we call crest factor. It's a fraction, it's a percentage, it's a ratio, whatever floats your boat, but the ratio of peak to average, that is what we call crest factor. And as an audio professional, you're expected to understand that very often the crest factor is referred to as the peak to average ratio on a linear scale, that is to say as a, as a fraction. And here you see that fraction in front of you. The peak value between bars means that it's sign insensitive. We don't care whether it's a positive or negative peak. We only care about the magnitude of the peak. And the RMS value lives downstairs. 
The ratio between those two is called crest factor. And for pink noise, you're expected to know that this is a factor of four. However, you can pick up any manual or any data sheet, and it could also very well be that the same crest factor is specified in decibels rather than a fraction. So what changes? You simply take the 20 log base 10 of your ratio, and that gives you the crest factor expressed in uh, decibels. So in case of pink noise, as we're about to uh, discover, the peaks are four times taller than its average value, and in decibels, that becomes 12 dB. And for reasons, for historical reasons, historical reasons, you're expected to know the difference between one and the other, but they mean the same thing. Four to one, a four to one peak to average ratio in decibels becomes 12 decibels and vice versa. So there you have your crest factor. So why then do we like to say how hard I'd hit the snare drum determines the peak, but how often I hit the snare drum determines the average value. Why do we like to say that? Well, look over here. Over here, we see a single snare drum hit indicated by the blue line in a given time interval. And um, the red line, which represents our average value, our mean value, our DC equivalent value, that average line is proportional to the area underneath the curve. And right now we have one single snare drum hit, so we have a little bit of area underneath the curve, which determines my average level. Now, if I hit the snare drum twice within the same interval, without hitting it harder or softer, just with the same intensity, if I hit the snare drum twice within the same interval, then my peak value hasn't changed. It hasn't gone up, it hasn't gone down, but I have twice the amount of area underneath my curve within the same time interval. And if the area doubles, then the RMS value goes up with three decibels. And the difference between peak and average, that's my crest factor, just shrunk because I hit the drum twice within the same time interval rather than once. And every time I hit the snare drum more often within the same interval, every time I hit the snare drum more often, the area underneath my alternating curve, my alternating waveform, the area underneath the waveform rises, it gains market share, and if the area goes up underneath the curve, the RMS level goes up, and as long as I hit the snare drum with the same intensity, the difference between peak and average becomes less and less and less and less. And that's why we like to say RMS is the difference between how hard you hit the snare drum and how often you hit the snare drum in a given time interval. So there you have your introduction into crest factor. And now we're going to explore how, how does the crest factor behave for pink noise and how does the crest factor behave for actual music. So that means that I'm going to uh, stop looking at the uh, presentation and let's go to a digital audio workstation where I have some pink noise uh, prepared. So here we have a digital audio workstation and the first uh, waveform that we see over here is pink noise, nothing special. Let's, um, let's see if we can hear this. Can you confirm that you can hear the pink noise coming out of the digital audio workstation? Anyone? Excellent. Now, I've also used a, a very simple uh, plugin that allows me to observe the crest factor. And the crest factor is shown over here. Notice that uh, it, it's, it, the sign is negative, but you can forget about the sign for all intents and purposes. It's the magnitude that I'm interested in. Notice that for pink noise, this value, broadband pink noise, mind you, no band limiting, that this value is 12 decibels, as we already predicted uh, during the previous slides. Factor 4 to 1, if you will. So the peak to average ratio in decibels is about 12 decibels for pink noise, all frequencies included. Okay, so far, so good. That being said, now I'm curious what happens if I now start to band limit my pink noise. So rather than listening to the entire audible frequency range, rather than listening to the entire audible frequency, only let's listen to one octave, which means that I'm going to use a plugin, and this plugin will throw away nine out of 10 octaves, because we can hear, oh, let's say one out of nine. This one is going to throw away eight out of nine octaves of pink noise, leaving us with only a one octave wide interval, as you can see by looking at the shape of this filter. And why don't we start, for those that are uh, listening through the computer loudspeakers, why don't we start at 250 hertz today? Because any lower frequencies will not come out of your computer loudspeakers. 
So why don't we start listening to the same pink noise, one octave rather than the entire audible band, one octave, and have a look at that crash factor value. So I'm gonna press play. And now we're only listening to the octave centered at 250 Hertz. And please take note of the crash factor value. Notice that this value is staying very close to the broadband crash factor, which is 12 decibels. It's within one dB, give or take, within one dB of the value you would expect to see um, for the entire audible band. So think about it, how robust ping noise is. I just threw away 90% of all audible information and the crash factor for pink noise is functionally the same. Okay, let's see what changes if we go up in frequency. What happens if we now go to one kilohertz rather than 250 hertz? So now we're only listening at one octave at one kilohertz. And notice that that value remains functionally the same. Again, we're listening to one octave and the crash factor remains virtually the same. Okay, let's go up higher in frequency. Why don't we go to uh, four kilohertz? Now we're listening to one octave at four kilohertz. And uh, notice that again, the crest factor remains functionally unchanged. It stays very clue, very true to that value of 12 dB. Okay, well then let's go all the way up to eight kilohertz. Now we're listening to one octave at eight kilohertz. And again, that crest factor remains essentially 12 decibels, give or take. So what I'm doing here is the poor man's version of the research that Meyer Sound conducted using a more sophisticated means. But this is the poor man version. This is my way of showing you that the crest factor for pink noise does not change as a function of frequency. We looked at several octaves and the crest factor remained the same as the entire audible band. So if we were to plot this, if we were to plot this in a chart, you get the following progression. In the bottom left to right, we see frequency on the logarithmic scale. And on the left side, uh, top to bottom, we see crest factor expressed in decibels. And please notice, please notice that for pink noise, that crest factor stays very close to 12 decibels, even if you tear it completely apart with the bandpass filter that we used uh, just now. The crest factor for pink noise remains virtually unaffected. Do you think that this is also the case for music? Would you expect the same for music? If we were to repeat this exercise with music, would you expect to see a similar progression, a crest factor that remains constant over frequency? Or does your suspicion tell you that um, it will probably change? Well, why don't, we, why don't we investigate that together once more using the uh, poor, man, uh, poor man's version? which means that I've prepared some royalty-free music. And let's take our filter out, no filter at all. And um, let's listen at um, some classical music. Okay. Now, pay attention to that um, crest factor value shown in the bottom right corner. So this is broadband. This is all frequencies included. And um, that value, yeah, it's not that far. It's not that far from pink noise. Pink noise is 12 decibels broadband, and this stays roughly between 12 and 14. So, so far, pink noise doesn't appear to be such a bad uh, proxy for actual music. But let's see whether this is also true once we start to chop up our audible band in octaves once more starting again at um, 250 hertz for those that are listening on laptop speakers. So let's listen to the same piece of music, but only look at, um, let's look only at uh, those frequencies at 250 hertz. Notice that the crest factor in this octave, also for classical music, um, stays very close to the value you would find for ping noise. So that is very promising so far for ping noise. Let's see whether this stays true when we go up uh, an octave. Now we're at 500 Hertz. 
I still see values in order of 12 decibels, give or take. So what if we go to 1 kilohertz? Now we're at 1 kilohertz. Still values around 12 decibels. Same like pink noise. Oh, let's go back to the start of the wave file. Okay, so 1 kilohertz. Values of around 12 decibels. But um, what happens if we go to higher frequencies? Like 4 kilohertz. Pink noise at 4 kilohertz would still be a value of 12. But um, if I look at the values over here, then for classical music, we're now seeing 16, 17, 18, 15, 16, 18. So notice that the crest factor has uh, gone up in contrast to pink noise. What happens if we go to um, 8 kilohertz? At 8 kilohertz, this is where my transients live. And I see values in order of 16 dB, uh, 16 dB. Um, let's go back to the beginning of the waveform. Okay, let's reset the meter. 13, 16, 20, 20, 21. And this is where I hit the tambourine. And this is where I hit my transients. And remember, how hard I hit the snare drum determines the peak of the transient. But how often I hit the snare drum determines the average level. And the transients that we hear over here are sparse. There are white spaces between consecutive transients, which determine the crest factor. So there you have an example for classical music. Um, let's do one more without the filter, but you get the idea. Let's do one more for um, um, some contemporary music. So here we have a piece of contemporary music, all frequencies included, and uh, values about 10, 12, 14 decibels all frequencies included. Well, so far, it's more or less like um, pink noise. But um, let's go up in frequency. Sorry, I'm looking at the front. Uh, let's engage our filter. Apologies. Let's engage our filter now, starting at 250 hertz again. And uh, let's single out a single octave. So this is the same piece of music at 250 hertz, one octave. And sure, 10, 12 decibels, right? Not unlike pink noise. So let's go up in frequency. Let's go to um, one kilohertz. One kilohertz, still 12 decibels, give or take, like pink noise. This was also true for the classical music. But um, let's see what happens if we go up higher in frequency. Now we're at four kilohertz. And notice that, whoa, that crest factor has now gone up dramatically. I see values of 18, 21, 22 decibels. Again, this is where the transients live in music and they are crucial for a uh, crest factor. And uh, let's go up um, one octave uh, more. Now we're at eight kilohertz, same piece of music. And now we see values in order of 18 decibels, 20 decibels, uh, 19 decibels. Uh, and this is again where the transients live, 22 decibels. So there you see what changes when you stop looking at the entire audible band, but start looking at one octave at a time. So if you do this for a lot of music, and we're talking about hundreds of hundreds of samples, then time and again, you will see the same progression. And that progression is shown over here. Now, I would like to remind you that the, the um, I would like to remind you that the pink line was the previous result that we established for pink noise, whose crest factor remains functionally the same with frequency. But if you do this for music, then for music, um, you will see that without exception, there comes a point where if you go up in frequency, that the crest factor goes up in frequency as well. And here you just see a subset of all the samples that we looked at. But without exception, there comes a point where the crest factor of Real music, the program material that you and I ultimately end up listening to, where the crest factor goes up. And that is something that pink noise doesn't do. Pink noise still lives over here at plus minus uh, around 12 decibels, unlike real music. So that was reason to come up with a new test signal called M noise that does a better job at approximating those properties that we are seeing over here for music. Because the blue line shows you the crest factor as a function of frequency for M noise. And notice that below 500 hertz, below 500 hertz, which is to the left over here, below 500 hertz, M noise 
and pink noise are functionally the same. They have functionally the same crest factor as a function of frequency. However, if we now go up in frequency, pink noise would remain functionally the same, whereas M noise now has a crest factor that rises like music. And that is the reason that why we claim that this test signal, which we're about to listen to, is a superior approximation of the actual program content that you and I ultimately end up listening to, um, a better approximation, a better proxy than uh, pink noise, which we have been using historically. But now the question becomes, um, if the crest factor goes up, what has happened? Have the peaks become louder and did the average level remain the same? Or are the peaks remaining constant and is the average level rolling off of our combination of the two? Because it's the difference between the two, peak and average, that determines the crest factor. So what has changed in actual music? Do the peaks get louder as you go up in frequency or is it the average value that gets softer? And let's see if we can, if we can see that. So over here, we see the, the spectral composition. We see the spectral content, a line spectrum of M noise. And notice that M noise rolls off at mid and high frequencies. Here we see the mid and high frequencies being attenuated. Um, and this is also true for a lot of other test signals. Uh, over here, we just mentioned several. These are certainly not all, but these are just a handful of test signals, which all claim to uh, approximate the program content of music. And music, as we saw at the beginning of this uh, presentation, music also has mid and high frequencies that roll off. So that is something that has been around for some time. There are several test signals out there that show the same trend, uh, which is also true for M noise. But what was discovered during the research conducted at Meyer Sound is that even though the average values roll off at mid and high frequencies, what was discovered is that the peaks remain virtually constant in level. So if you now look at the peak levels shown on the right side for music, then you will discover that the peak levels, if you sample a lot of music, that the peak levels remain functionally constant, whereas the average level drops as you go up in frequency. And it's the difference between those two, between peak and average, that is what we call crest factor. So the crest factor rises not because the peaks become louder, but because the average value as you go up in frequency becomes softer. Um, so that is an important distinction. And all of those features are living in M noise, which you supposedly should be able to hear now. So was everybody able to hear it? Let's play it once more. Let's play it once more. Do you hear the M noise? Excellent. Now, if you listen very carefully, you might notice that there are pops and crackles. There are pops and crackles. It sounds like pink noise being played from a record player. And yes, it is intended to sound like that. It's interesting that one of the most common questions that we get at Meyer Sound is, there's something wrong with the file. I hear glitches. I hear pops and crackles. The file has not been properly encoded. There must be some clocking issues because I hear glitches. But it's those glitches which make M noise unique. It's those pops and crackles which cause M noise's crash factor to rise with frequency as well as real music does. So there's nothing wrong with this file. It's exactly sounding the way we intended it to sound. You can think of it as ping noise being mashed up with impulses, and those impulses are the cause that make the crash factor rise. Um, and this file can be downloaded for free for free at mnoise.org. Um, there is a reason why mnoise does not live at the Meyer Sound website, because we genuinely hope that with a little bit of luck that this gets adapted and adopted into a standard. So we realize that a certain distance between Meyer Sound, the loudspeaker manufacturer, and the test signal, that a di certain distance is appropriate if we want the industry at large to adopt this test signal and test procedure. And that's why it lives on its own website. Um, and there you can download the file for free. It has an entire 
education, education section with several videos explaining why we feel that this is a good idea and how to conduct these measurements, which we of course also discuss during uh, today's webinar. Now, the next part is not going to talk about the test signal anymore. It's going to talk about how to use the test signal in conjunction with a procedure. And that procedure is equally important, if not more important, than the test signal itself. The test signal itself is just a better approximation for real music, unlike pink noise. But it's the procedure that we're hoping to get standardized, which would allow us to level the playing field and would allow us to determine the sound level with published rules of engagement with published stop condition. And in order to execute that procedure, we're going to make use of a dual channel transfer function analyzer, which is something that we already talked about during our previous webinar on virtual sim, which you can find on our YouTube thinking sound uh, channel, YouTube channel. But we're going to use a transfer function analyzer, uh, such as smart or sim in our case. And um, we need a volume knob because we want to drive the system into trouble. What do I mean into trouble? We want to drive the system so loud that we meet certain stop conditions. And once those stop conditions have been met, we stop driving the system, we stop increasing the drive level, and we will document the SPL value at a yet to be determined position. So in our uh, ecosystem, the um, Galaxy, uh, Galaxy device will serve as the volume knob because we have self-powered loudspeakers, but we still need to increase the signal, the drive level to the loudspeaker to trigger those stop conditions. And in order to increase the drive level, we use uh, our Galaxy device as a volume knob. Um, that being said, you can do this with any system, self-powered, active or passive. There's nothing that stops you from uh, testing this uh, yourself. That being said, what is a transfer function? We already talked about this during the previous webinar, but imagine that for sake of simplicity, I were to inject, I were to inject pink noise into my system under test, which happens to be a line array element. I inject pink noise, flat spectrum, equal power per octave into my loudspeaker, and I pick up the output of the loudspeaker with a measurement microphone, and then I observe the output spectrum. Well, then you might be able to identify that uh, several things have several things have changed because the spectrum, the input spectrum was uh, flat. The input spectrum was flat, as we can tell over here. But what comes out of the loudspeaker uh, has less low frequencies and shows an emphasis of mid and high frequencies, which is perfectly normal for a line array element. Uh, but we talked about that in Lena House of Worship. We call that the native response. Goes without saying that the thing that I'm trying to get across here is that the output spectrum of the loudspeaker and the input spectrum of the loudspeaker, they differ with respect to each other. And that is what we compare in a transfer function. In a transfer function, we compare the output spectrum against the input spectrum. And whatever sets the output apart from the input, that is known as the transfer function. So notice over here that the low frequencies are missing because they do not come out of the system under test. And notice that indeed mid and high frequencies have been somewhat emphasized. I mean, I could already see that over here. You know, if I pay very close attention, I could already see the same uh, trend, but it's this transfer function that sets our output apart from our input. And that's the very thing that um, we're interested in, the transfer function. How does the output differ from the input? Now, if you're dealing with a system which is linear, which is what we were talking about at the beginning of the webinar, we want a system that faithfully reproduces our waveform, which is the electronic representation of art, regardless of what it looks like. We want it to represent that waveform. Um, then a linear system is expected to go up in output level proportional to input level. That is to say, if my input level goes up, then a linear system has to follow the input level in lockstep. If it doesn't, it's not a linear system. If the input becomes two times louder and the output doesn't go up as well, then it's not linear. Whereas if the input becomes two times louder and the output becomes two times louder as well, then we're in the linear range. And this is of course what every audio professional would expect of a loudspeaker. It also means that as long as output and input follow each other in lockstep, that the transfer function is not expected to change. 
Let's see if this is true by going to the next slide. In the next slide, we're going to increase our drive level, which you see downstairs. And as long as the loudspeaker is linear, the transfer function doesn't change and the output goes up as well. But sooner or later, later every loudspeaker goes into compression or starts to distort or uh, starts to produce smoke and all sorts of nastinesses. And the moment that one of those things happens, the system is clearly no longer linear. The output is basically pegged in place while the input keeps rising, 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 and we witness the onset of compression or distortion. In this case, it is compression. Notice that as we drove the system louder and louder, that we reached ultimately, we reached a point where the transfer function started to show a change. Notice that they no longer live perfectly on top of each other over there, which is how you can identify the onset of compression, which means that your output in this case is no longer capable of keeping up with your input. And that is one of the stop conditions that we will be looking for. But a lot of people reach out to us and they say, how does M noise change my daily routine of calibrating and voicing sound systems? And the answer is it doesn't. But people reason, well, it sure sounds different. I mean, M noise sounds vastly different from ping noise. So surely this should somehow affect my daily routine of calibrating and voicing sound systems, which is not true. This reveals an underlying challenge, which is that um, dual channel transfer analysis is still poorly understood even in 2020. Because if you understand the transfer function, you'll be able to appreciate that regardless of the excitation signal that we use on the left side, which is white noise, could be pink noise, uh, it could be red noise, it could be IEC 61672, which is another noise, it could be N noise. On the left, we have all these different excitation signals. It could even be music. But on the right side, we see the transfer function. And the transfer function doesn't change regardless of what excitation signal we use. Whether it's white, pink, red noise, M noise, music, the transfer function remains the same. And that is the reason why SIM is an abbreviation for source independent measurement. I can get a transfer function as long as all frequencies are accounted for. And whether those uh, frequencies are excited by M noise, music, pink noise, red noise, white noise, makes no difference. Even though to my ear, these excitation signals sound very different. So how does M noise change your daily routine of calibrating sound systems and voicing sound systems? It doesn't. We don't use M noise to calibrate and voice systems. We use pink noise for tried and tested reasons. There's no reason whatsoever to use M noise for calibration or voicing. M noise is a test signal whose sole purpose is to determine the maximum output capability of a loudspeaker or a sound system, which has nothing to do with how you calibrate it or voice it. It's a performance test. It's not a calibration tool. So M noise, pink noise, white noise, whatever floats your boat, for the transfer function, it makes no difference whatsoever because the excitation signal gets canceled out in the transfer function. We use pink noise and I, I, I see us doing so for the foreseeable future. Now, using M noise for performance testing, that's a different topic altogether. Another very important parameter is coherence. And coherence is basically a data quality indicator, loosely defined, very loosely defined. It indicates the quality of your data. It measures the correlation between what you put into your device and the test, which could be a black box, known way of knowing what it does. But if we have high correlation between input and output, it's all about, it's all about causality is what's coming out of the system exclusively caused by what I put into the system. If it is, then we have high coherent data. If it's not, then we need to look what's going on. Coherence is a fraction, it's a percentage, and it lives between zero and one, where 100% means that the device under test is 100% replicating what you put into it, no contamination. What could be contamination? Well, it could be a noise source, such as heating, ventilation, air conditioning, a vacuum cleaner, somebody using a drill. It could be transients because somebody's banging a truss together or uh, slamming a door shut. 
anything that is not part of the signal that you put into your device in the test uh, could be discarded as non-coherent power. Non-coherent as in non-causal, it has nothing to do with what you put into the system. So if you measure a value of 100% on an analyzer, such as SIM, where coherence is shown on the right-hand side, if you measure a value of 100%, then the analyzer is telling you everything that's coming out of your device in the test is 100% caused by what you put into it. Whereas if you have a value of 0%, then the analyzer is telling you everything that you're measuring has nothing to do with what you put into the system, completely unrelated to what you put into the system. And if you have 50%, which is the value that lives in the middle on the scale, it is telling you basically that you have one part signal, which is what you're interested in, and one part contamination, one part non-coherent power, which is what you're not interested in. That's why you can think of it loosely defined as a data quality indicator. And there are several things that will affect coherence, such as uncorrelated sounds. You finally have the venue to yourself. You finally have the venue to yourself. Okay, everybody has left the building. The lighting department has left the building. Uh, staging, scenery, they have left the building. You finally have the room quiet. You want to calibrate the system. You're measuring the system. And then, of course, there's always somebody that thinks, you know, why don't we start vacuum cleaning? So you have perfectly good coherence until somebody turns on the vacuum cleaner. Now there is an uncorrelated noise source contaminating your measurement and coherence drops because coherence says, I see, I see acoustical power, which is not coming out of the system. It's coming out of the vacuum cleaner. I see contamination of the measurement. So coherence drops until the noise source, in this case, the vacuum cleaner, the noise source is turned off. So if there's contamination, it will show up in coherence. So in order to do an M noise test, it's very important that there is no loss of coherence due to noise, because there are many things that will make coherence drop, but we want to eliminate noise as a possible cause for coherence loss. And that means that typically you'll end up measuring very close to the loudspeaker, because if you reduce the air gap then the direct sound gains market share, but the noise floor typically remains where it is. The difference between those two, your signal to noise floor, that grows as you come closer and closer to the loudspeaker, to the point that you're typically within one foot for a small loudspeaker, typical within one foot distance. And now you see that coherence is well above 97%, which is about 15 decibels of signal to noise. And the reason that we measure this close to the loudspeaker is because we want to eliminate noise as a possible cause for coherence loss. We want to measure coherence loss, but we do not want to measure coherence loss ca caused by noise, by contamination. And that's why the measurement microphone that's used for the transfer function lives so close to the loudspeaker to eliminate noise as a possible cause for coherence loss. Tip. Use coherence blanking, okay? Just set your coherence blanking to 97% and bring the microphone so close until all pixels are visible again, which means that none of your data is being masked by coherence and therefore has a coherence value of 97% or more. But we also want to monitor the disturbance caused by transient signals. I mean, the vacuum cleaner is a sustained noise source, but what about, in this case, a hammer and anvil test? What if uh, a colleague of mine hits an anvil? Notice that every time he hits it, after a little while, coherence drops, without exception. Every time he hits the anvil, there is a short disruption and coherence drops. We refer to that as a real-time transfer function analyzer. Now, with real-time, we do not mean that the analysis is performed in real-time because clearly there is lag between the point that the anvil is hit and that we see the disturbance in the coherence. But what we mean by real time is that all audio samples are being processed. No audio samples are being, um, are being overlooked. All audio samples are processed, not necessarily in real time, but no audio samples are being skipped. And that is something that you can see during this video. Every time he hits the anvil, there is a disturbance and that disturbance a little bit later shows up in the coherence. And that's important because those pops and crackles in the M noise wave files, they are not sustained signals. They are very transient 
uh, transient and short and spiky pops and crackles. And we don't want to miss those samples if they are being flat topped by hard clipping in a loudspeaker system or in a digital controller. So we need all audio samples to be uh, processed. However, besides uncorrelated sounds, such as vacuum cleaners and hammers and anvils, there are also other phenomena that affect um, coherence. Anyone that has ever measured a real loudspeaker in a real room knows that as you go into the room, that's to say towards the back of the room, increase your distance to the loudspeaker or sound system, that coherence becomes worse. Why? Your signal to noise ratio goes down and your direct to reverberant ratio goes down. And the reason that at low frequencies, coherence is always worse than at mid and high frequencies is because at low frequencies, most loudspeakers tend to be omnidirectional. And that means that they cannot keep, they cannot keep themselves, prevent themselves from exciting the room with energy. And because you're dealing with long wavelengths, the room upon impact, the walls upon impact typically don't absorb the energy, but throw it back at you. It's called reverberation. Um, whereas at mid and high frequencies, the horn allows us to at least confine that sound power within a slice of pizza, allow us to send the sound where it needs to be at our ears and not on the plaster. And that means that your direct to reverberant ratio at mid and high frequencies is typically higher, a higher Q factor, if you will, a higher directivity factor. And that's why with horn loaded loudspeakers, coherence is always worse at low frequencies and relatively speaking, better or uh, improved at mid and high frequencies. But this coherence does not suffice to do an M noise test. Uh, we have way too much of the room creeping into our measurement. So how do we fix that? Well, in a similar fashion like you do with noise, by reducing the distance between the microphone and the loudspeaker. And every time we reduce the distance, every time we reduce the distance, you will see that coherence improves without exception. And sooner or later, you are close enough that coherence is above the 97% uh, starting point. And that means that not only have you eliminated noise as a possible cause for coherence loss, but you've also now eliminated, eliminated the room, that is to say acoustics, as a possible cause for coherence loss. Because what other cause is left over that can make coherence become worse? Distortion. And that is, of course, something that we're very much interested in. If the loudspeaker is distorting, it's no longer linear. And if it's no longer linear, it's messing with the waveform, which was the electronic representation of art. This is something that I want to monitor. And this is something that coherence will show, provided distortion is the only known cause for coherence loss. And that's why we need to measure so close to eliminate the room, to eliminate noise as a contender a possible contender for coherence loss. And that's why we measure so close, because if there is to be a loss of coherence, then the only cause that we're interested in is distortion. And distortion will make your coherence drop. Over here, we see a band spectrum of noise, ping noise once more. And this is the problem with the band spectrum, with an RTA. Even when I introduce as much as 50% harmonic distortion, it will not show up in the band spectrum. You will not see distortion on a real-time analyzer, on a band spectrum, even if it's a you know using an FFT rather than you know conventional RTA like you know long time ago. Regardless, if you introduce as much as 50% uh, harmonic distortion, it will not noticeably alter the band spectrum. But if you were to look at a dual channel transfer function analyzer and introduce distortion, oh, will coherence be affected by the presence of distortion? In the next slide that we're about to see, I should say in the next video that we're about to see, uh, we have a proprietary black box that allows you to introduce as much as 100% distortion. So all the way counterclockwise is no distortion and all the way clockwise is as much as 100% distortion. And, um, Notice how that affects the coherence. Here we go. So first with noise, first using noise. If I crank up the potentiometer all the way to 100%, you notice that coherence drops. But it's also true for music. Different genre, 
try a different song. Let's do one more. And just for fun, let's do another one. So hopefully by now you're able to appreciate that whenever we increase the amount of distortion that without exception coherence drops. So under the right conditions, that is to say in the absence of actual noise, such as heating, ventilation and air conditioning and vacuum cleaners, and in the absence of acoustics, in the absence of um, reverberation and such, if those conditions are taken care of and there is a loss of coherence, to be observed, then the only likely candidate is distortion. And of course, distortion is undesirable, is nonlinear. And that is something that will actually show up in your coherence. And to give you a sense of what we're dealing with, okay, um, once coherence drops below 91%, uh, okay, once coherence drops below 91%, then depending on which frequency you ask, you're already looking at um, total harmonic distortion in, in order of 15%. Now, believe you me, if you're listening to a sound system with 15% harmonic distortion, unless it's part of the artistic making decision process, but if you're listening to 15% harmonic distortion, you and I will both voluntarily leave the room. Um, so um, there you see that you know if there's distortion as much as 15%, it will really uh, show up in your coherence and coherence will drop below 91%. And that is the other stop condition. So with uh, this knowledge in, in the back of our mind, we need to ask one more question before we can look at the actual procedure itself, which is where do I set the playback level? Where does the volume knob live? Because we need to drive our system, whether it's self-powered or active or passive, we need to drive our system so loud that we trigger uh, those stop conditions where we say until here or no further, otherwise the system becomes nonlinear. And that means that we need to have a short discussion about where does the volume knob live? If the volume knob lives all the way upstream and we were to increase the level, then the reference signal becomes louder in my transfer function, and so does the microphone. And that means that as long as the system is linear and the volume knob lives upstream, that the transfer function is not expected to change, even if we increase the level. That is to say, it's not expected to change provided the loudspeaker is linear. So here you see that if we increase the level, that both reference and microphone follow each other in lockstep. The transfer function does not change provided the system is still in its linear range of operation. Whereas if the volume knob were to live over here and I were to increase the volume, then my microphone becomes louder because the loudspeaker becomes louder, but my reference signal remains exactly at the same level. And now the transfer function becomes volatile. It becomes volatile because it becomes a function of where the potentiometer lives, the potentiometer lives. And uh, you can see that here. If we increase the level, the microphone goes up and down, but the reference signal remains exactly where it is. So the volume knob cannot live over there. The volume knob has to live upstream, uh, and that is a very important distinction. And all of this, what we're about to see during the next 15 minutes, all of this is carefully documented. The procedure, which is equally important if not important, this is what we're trying to get standardized using mnoise as the source, but this is what we're trying to get standardized. This procedure can be found at mnoise.org, again, uh, you can read it on the website, but you can also download it as a PDF. On the right side, you see the PDF. And now the challenge becomes to drive the system so loud that one of two stop conditions is met. And the first stop condition is if we try to determine the maximum playback level, how loud does this loudspeaker go? Then we stop 
when we either, that's the first subcondition, see two to be of compression over at least two octaves. So if we see two to be of compression over at least a two octave interval, we say stop until here and no further because now the output can no longer keep up with the input. System is going into compression. Um, some people always ask why not three dB or why not one dB? Uh, because uh, there are standards that use three dB. Um, but the thing with three dB is that three dB is already bordering uh, to become a destructive test. With three dB of compression, things could get damaged. And that is of course something that we want to avoid because M noise and the procedure is a performance test and the loudspeaker is expected to recover afterwards because tomorrow you have the next show and the day after you have the next show. So it's a non-destructive test. It should not damage the loudspeaker. And that's the reason why two dB of compression at most is acceptable because any more compression would turn it into a destructive test, which is not the intent of this procedure. It's a performance test, a non-destructive performance test. Well, why don't you do 1 dB then? Well, 1 dB has been determined experimentally. 1 dB is too small of a difference to make the test repeatable. That is to say, if I were to hand out this procedure to 10 people and say, go measure the same loudspeaker, I would get, I would get uh, different outcomes because 1 dB is too small of a difference to make the test repeatable, repetitive. It's turned out experimentally that 2 dB is the right order of magnitude uh, to get consistent results, which means that if you aim for two decibels of compression and I were to have 10 individuals execute this test, I'm going to get results that are in good agreement with each other without destroying the loudspeaker because it's a non-destructive performance test. So when we see two dB of compression over at least two octaves, we say stop. This is how loud we can drive the system. There is a second subcondition and that says if coherence drops below 91%, we also say stop. So while we're conducting this test, coherence is expected to remain above 91%. Because if it drops below 91%, then in the absence of actual noise and in the absence of reverberation and such, the only likely suspect for making the coherence go down is distortion. Now, M-Noise will not tell you what kind of distortion. It's an indicator, but M-Noise will tell you something is distorting, and now you have to conduct additional testing to figure out what kind of distortion and what is distorting. That's not M-Noise's purpose. That's not the procedure's purpose, but it will indicate distortion without revealing the specific kind of distortion. This procedure is not a replacement for tried and tested methods such as THD and intermodulation distortion and such. But if there's distortion, this procedure will reveal it, and then it's up to the user to start investigating what is the nature of the distortion and what is causing it. That being said, if coherence drops below 91% due to distortion, we say stop because the loudspeaker is no longer linear. Whichever stop condition is met first is where we stop driving the system. Okay, It could be distortion going first, it could be compression going first. It could be both at once. But once one of these stop conditions is met, no matter which one comes first or second, once one of these stop conditions is met, we say, stop. This is as loud as we're willing to go using a test signal such as M-Noise, which is a better approximation of music, the actual program content that you and I end up listening to. Once we've determined that maximum playback level, that's why it's called maximum playback level, we stop driving the system we're in a state of compression or we're in a state of distortion or both, but we stop at these, uh, these clearly defined stop conditions. We stop driving the system and now we get our XL2 or whatever sound level meter you have. And now we're going to document the SPL that we attained at a preferred listening position. Now, what is a preferred listening position? In the interest of a data sheet, this would typically be one meter or four meters, but then reference back to one meter by adding 12 decibels to account for the inverse square law. But in the interest of a data sheet, you would typically do this at one to four meters distance. It could also be that in the interest for validating system performance, you might want to do this at the front of house position and validate whether the system delivers the expected SPL value, regardless whether it's A-weighted or C-weighted or Z-weighted, but does it live does it deliver the SPL that we asked for? In which case, the preferred listening position would be 
at the front of house position. So it's up to the user to measure the ultimate SPL after determining the playback level to measure the ultimate SPL at a position of your choosing. In the interest of a data sheet, typically anywhere from one to four meters, and, uh, but it could also be to validate a system. So let's look at that in action. How would you use a dual, trend of, dual channel transfer function analyzer such as Smart or Sim to determine the maximum playback level, which is the first step? Well, we have our microphone that is used for the transfer function, living close to the loudspeaker, where we have ample coherence for reasons that we discussed. And uh, we bring up the excitation signal to a level where we are confident that the system is still effortlessly within its linear range. And then we capture that trace, and we refer to that trace as the initial playback level. Okay, And that shows the shape of the transfer function when the system is linear. So we store that trace. Now we increase the level by 3 dB more. And if the system is linear, which we can verify by looking at the shape of the transfer function and the shape of the coherence, if it's linear, they're not expected to change. And that second trace is called the target compression curve. We store that result as well, and we give it a cosmetic offset, a bump of 2 dB. We lower that trace cosmetically by 2 dB. Because if we now keep driving the system more and more and more, then sooner or later, the active measurement shown by the blue line, that is the active shape of the active measurement, if that shape changes for whatever reason, then the system is no longer linear. And by the time that active measurement shown by the blue trace kisses, touches, the red trace, which is my target compression curve with a 2 dB offset, we can accurately identify the onset of two decibels of compression. And that's where we say, stop. So once you've increased the level so far until you see that 2 dB compression over at least two octaves, we say stop until here and no further. Now we get to bring out our sound level meter, and now we get to document the sound level. In this case, we're doing it at one meter, and that shows us that our peak value is 123.6, whereas our average value, our average value is 109.2, because peak max is um, is the uh, sorry peak max is the instantaneous value, the maximum value. That's the one that we're looking for. The the peak is the instantaneous value. So we have 126.7, which was the highest peak that we recorded, and we have an average value of 109. And the difference between those two is of course your crest factor. And you want to validate that the loudspeaker can preserve the broadband crest factor of M-noise, which is 17 and a half dB, which this loudspeaker can, even in face of two decibels of compression. So up until now, we have proven that this loudspeaker is capable of faithfully reproducing the M-noise wave file, which is a better approximation for music actual program content that we ultimately end up listening to. And then by extension, one could argue that if the loudspeaker can faithfully reproduce M noise, then it's very likely being able, will be able to do so for music as well, which is ultimately the thing that we want to know. How loud does a loudspeaker go while listening to music, using M noise as a proxy? And that's why I started with the metaphor of, remember, that waveform, regardless of what it looks like, is the electronic representation of art. So we have determined the maximum playback level at one meter distance, okay? And now we can do, you know, we can publish this for a different loudspeaker, mind you. We can publish this in a data sheet. So over here, for example, you will see the specifications for an Ultra X40 telling you that the linear peak, because there's no distortion, no, no, no distortion worth mentioning, and there's no compression worth mentoring due to the per procedure. Now, this will show you the linear peak value, which is 132.5 decibels with an 18 dB crest factor using M noise as the source, using music noise as the source. And what is unique about this is that you now know which stop conditions were reached when we documented that value, which you normally don't know. Because as I set out, you know, at the beginning of this webinar, nobody discloses the stop conditions. They write down a number, but they don't tell you what made them stop. This procedure, should it become, uh, should it become adopted as a standard, this procedure will make it happen that the manufacturer is expected to disclose the stop conditions. And 
that would level the playing field. Now we know which conditions have been reached when the maximum level was attained. And that means that for the first time, you would be able to compare two data sheets knowing that both manufacturers stopped at the same point. That is to say, stopped while respecting the same stop conditions. And even more important is that an audio professional with access to the same gear could now validate this. That is to say, everything that you need to do this, you have. You don't need an anechoic room for this. You don't need laboratory grade equipment for this. Most audio professionals have everything that they need to conduct this test. And now they can validate the manufacturer claim and validate whether manufacturers being truthful or not. Because the procedure is documented and the stop conditions are stop documented and all the tools that you need to do this, you have within your means. Um, and an audio professional can, can reconstruct the experiment and can validate these figures. So what is then the maximum SPL test, if not measuring at one meter distance like we did before? Well, the maximum SPL test would consist of the following steps. You put a microphone at the PLP, which is your preferred listening position. In this example, that would be the front of house to validate system performance. You bring the loudspeaker level back to the previously determined maximum playback level, which we previously determined. And now we can measure the sound level at the PLP at the preferred listening position. And we do this test for five minutes because there is such a thing as thermal, which is to say the voice coil could warm up, could heat up during this test, in which case it becomes less efficient and could worsen the amount of compression, in which case you would have to rinse and repeat. That is to say, you would have to lower the driver level, the drive level, and uh, you would have to restart the experiment. But if there's no change in either compression or distortion during that five minute interval, then after five minutes, you know, we've gotten to a point where you can start documenting those values. It might be worth pointing out that we don't do this after five minutes, we do this after two hours. So in this state of compression, to the compression, we let the system run for two hours and we make sure that during those two hours, things don't get worse. Um, if there's no change after two hours, then we document the value for a very simple reason. Two hours is the average duration of a concert or the average duration of a feature film. And we expect our products to be able to sustain that level, that maximum level to sustain that for two hours and recover afterwards. So that's why we do the test for two hours and then we document the value. We don't expect users doing this you know, in their backyard or in their driveway. We don't expect them to do it for two hours, but five minutes, um, you know, five minutes is, is, a, is a reasonable duration, okay? So there you have your maximum SPL test. Now, all of this is documented at Amnoise, including FAQ, many questions like, you know, is it supposed to sound like this? Yes. And um, so all of those questions can be found over there. That being said, let's look at a, an example of a different loudspeaker because in Meyer sound, we never see distortion. That is to say, distortion is never the primary cause uh, that we say stop until here and no further. Of the two stop conditions, which are compression and distortion, in our ecosystem, it's always compression which comes first with little or no distortion whatsoever. So we don't see a coherence drop for our products because our products are always uh, protected in such a way that they go into compression first prior to going into distortion because we want them to remain linear. So when we test our products using this procedure, we always see compression first. And that means that we never get to drive the system to a point that we actually start to see distortion because it doesn't meet our standards. That being said, there are products out there which go into distortion first before the onset of compression. And that's something that I would like to show to you. Over here, we have a product. And uh, notice that at a moderate, moderate level of 96 dB, moderate level of 96 dB, there are no signs of compression. There are little or no signs of compression. But if you pay careful attention, you will notice that um, if we increase the drive level a little bit, okay, you will see that sooner or later, you know, that at very high frequencies, sooner or later, that coherence, which is already wiggling, will drop below 91%. And once it does drop below 91% for more than one third octave, we say stop. Because 
This is an indicator in the absence of actual noise and reverberation. This is an indicator that's telling you that your loudspeaker is distorting. It's going into distortion for those frequencies. We don't know the kind of distortion, the nature of distortion, but we can tell with certainty that it's distorting at those frequencies. And then we say stop because the procedure is about linear reproduction, linear reproduction. So by our standards, the value would then be a peak value of 112.2 and an average value of 97.3. And notice that at this moderate level, this particular product is no longer capable of preserving the 17 and a half to be broadband crest factor uh, for M noise. And it's not even, you know, it's not even loud. This is a moderate level and it's already in trouble. That is to say this loudspeaker at this level of, of um, level at this workload is already no longer capable of preserving the full crest factor. So if it can't do it for M noise, well, then probably it will also not be able to do it for music. And that means by this standard, by this procedure, these would be the values that you would document. Okay, if we choose to ignore this, if we choose to ignore the distortion, which we see over there, and now start to drive the system even louder to the point that we actually see compression, of course, we get a bigger number. We would also need to drive the loudspeaker harder and harder and harder. And now the active measurement shown by the black trace kisses my 2 dB target compression curve. Sure, now we see 2 dB of compression and we get to say, wow, 115 dB peak and 104 dB on average. But also notice that your entire high frequency section is grossly distorting. Remember, 91% coherence is about 15% harmonic distortion, give or take. So if we ignore the distortion and only look for the onset of compression, then sure, this is the level that you can attain. And after five minutes or so, you can then start uh, documenting those levels, which means that after five, uh, five minutes, you know, you can start documenting your peak and your average values. Notice that if we do that, that indeed this loudspeaker has a peak value of 118 dB and an average value of 104. And the crest factor has shrunk even more. It's now 14 decibels. Not to mention that uh, for almost half of the audible spectrum, the loudspeaker is distorting. And uh, in this example, the value shown on the right side, those are the values that were published in the data sheet for this particular product. And now you see the problem with such a number. This number does not reveal how the loudspeaker sounds by the time you get there. Once I reach these levels, does the loudspeaker still sound acceptable or do I want to make, you know, do I want to leave the room because it's distorting? There's no way without disclosing the stop conditions, there's no way how you can tell from this double or triple digit figure, there's no way how you can tell whether the loudspeaker still sounds acceptable. And that means that if I compare two data sheets without the stop conditions being disclosed, I cannot compare apples to apples or orange to orange because I don't know whether both manufacturers play by the same rules. And there's no way of telling me whether the loudspeaker is still enjoyable to listen to, should I ultimately get to that point. And, um, and that's why standardization is so important. So important. Um, just to finish up, you know, this is what 15% THD sounds like, okay? Notice that the coherence shows you the trend for M noise, which is dense. But uh, with this amount of distortion for music, um, you will see that as long as there's notes, because music is... But as long as notes are being played, notice that M noise does a perfect approximation, prediction of where coherence is expected to live, provided those notes, that is to say those frequencies, are being played. And um, to an audio professional, this kind of distortion would be utterly and utterly unacceptable, unless it's part of the artistic decision-making process, which is a different conversation altogether. Okay, so you get the general idea, and maybe by now you might be able uh, to appreciate why the AES has an interest in this procedure using a signal which is a better approximation um, for actual music, the program content that you and I ultimately end up listening to.
So um, AS is open to all AS members, which means that uh, for all I know, uh, you might be interested in joining the conversation, in which case, you know, let us know. Uh, the more, the merrier. I'm very happy to tell you that this task group currently counts over 60 task group members and everyone in the industry is basically represented um, from automotive to, uh, to consumer electronics. Everybody is interested in this because we all agree that the time has come, that the playing field should be leveled and we should be able to compare the weight of two loudspeakers, which nobody debates, we should be able to compare the maximum performance of a loudspeaker in a similar fashion, like we can determine, you know, compare the weight of a loudspeaker. Nobody is second guessing the weight because we have consensus on the definition of a kilogram. But in the absence of published stop conditions, we'll never be able to compare the maximum output capability of, um, of two loudspeakers. So, um, you know, let's cross our fingers and see whether uh, we can do something which is unprecedented, which is standardization, standardization of the determination of maximum performance level for loudspeakers in such a way that we're still linear, that the art is preserved. And that brings us to the end of a really, really dense, but very, very interesting topic, which is M noise. Before we go to Q&A, um, I'm very pleased to inform you that this Friday, none other than our director, director of uh, system optimization, Bob McCarthy, will take us on a historical journey through theater sound. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this. So be sure to join us this Friday at um, 6 p.m. Central European time, 9 a.m. Pacific time, because uh, that one, knowing Bob, is going to take at least as long as this one, but boy, uh, do we have uh, a lot of history to cover? Um, very much looking forward to this. Okie dokie. That brings us to the end of uh, this presentation, which means that um, I'm more than happy to spend a couple of more minutes uh, answering any questions you might have. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the chat, um, the chat to do so. So, can we summarize like this? The crest factor is the dynamic between the RMS value and the peak value. And because of transients living at high frequency in music signals, this dynamic of crest factor is increasing with frequency. That's why M noise has a crest factor increasing with frequency to mimic music. Yes, that is completely correct. There were already test signals that had the same spectral content as music, but they filled one mission critical component, which is that they filled, they were not featuring the dynamic range that you observe in real music. Uh, and this is something that we managed to capture within M-Noise. So yes, that's a perfect, uh, perfect uh, explanation of M-Noise. Any other questions at this point? Okie dokie. Well, then all that's left to do is uh, wish you and your loved ones all the best. Please stay safe and healthy. And uh, join us this Friday with Bob McCarthy on a historical journey through theater sound. Awesome. Um, okay. See you next time.